it is uh, incredibly, incredibly surreal to be here. I first set foot on this campus uh, as a 17-year-old freshman 32 years ago. And about 7 million miles of traveling later, I'm here. And the last time I was here was 1994. And my double take is I was expelled from Worcester twice. <laughs> and in trying to distill my thoughts about the College of Worcester and, and my experience and how to say something thought-provoking and interesting to you and to talk about double take as it was outlined in the, the syllabus, which I was really never good at following, which we'll talk about as well. Um, I kind of came down to one word uh, and one word about Worcester, and, and that's gratitude. Um, sometimes the farther you get away from something, the better and closer you can see it. And I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful for my experience here. And the first one is I met my wife, who is, I've been married to and blessed with for 21 years. She's always been much smarter than I have been. Our oldest girl turned 18 yesterday, so she's away at a exotic yet undisclosed location and chose not to be here at Worcester in the middle of February. But here she is today, and the experiences that we uniquely shared here together and the life that we have shared together have been a big part of why I am so grateful to Worcester. The second reason is, you can't read this, but I had a wonderful, wonderful person in my life here, Dean of Students, Ken Plasquelek, who unfortunately is no longer with us. But we had a running dialogue for many years and many police reports about all of my activities and he never stopped believing in me and believing in the opportunity that Worcester would provide for me as a person and that the way Worcester approached education and the way Worcester did things, particularly my next grateful thing, which is independent study, is an incredible, incredible experience if you do it right. And IS, I believe, is the at the forefront of teaching you how to be an independent thinker. And an independent thinker is what we need more of in the world. We don't need more lemmings. You need more people that truly have a look and a perspective at things that can take you from the conventional to the unconventional to new thoughts, new breakthroughs, new models, new opportunities, and new ways of doing things to make the world a better place. And that's what I got out of Worcester. I'm not sure I've always made the world a better place, but I certainly had the experience and the thought process here and the structure of learning, not necessarily structured learning as, as uh, our, our good president said earlier, and listening to him speak, I absolutely realized why I was never cut out to be a university or college president. Um, the, 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 the fiber that goes in to what independent study is, is really remarkable. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the farther you get away from it, the more clarity that you can get out of the experience. And when I was here in uh, 1983, uh, we decided one spring day to skip class, hard to believe, and drove to Morgantown, West Virginia, to the University of West Virginia, and went to my first Grateful Dead concert, my first of well over 100 Grateful Dead concerts. And in looking at the double take, in looking at everything, and looking what I ended up doing for a living and what I experienced, it was a quote that came to mind, you know, once in a while if you get shown the light in the strangest of the places if you look at it right. And I started looking at the Grateful Dead for what it was. All of a sudden, land in West Morgantown, West Virginia, one April day, and you're transformed into a completely different experience. There are people doing all sorts of things. There is a peaceful community. There is a vibrant community. Everything's great. Everything's wild. Everything's fun. There's exchange of goods and services. There's a whole bunch of different things, some legal, some not, but it was sure as hell a lot of fun. But what you saw was a very interesting premise, which it was really the Grateful Dead was the America's first social media company. Think about that. What these people did before any of us ever heard of social media, ever understood what the concept was, 
they created a sense of community. And the sense of community was driven on two hotlines. Most of you don't remember this, but you, if you wanted to find out where the Grateful Dead was playing or what was going on or when the tour was going to happen, you had to get somebody else to skip class. And on a rotary phone, dial one of these two numbers, depending on where you were, east or west of the Mississippi, and you would continually dial because it was busy. You'd get a busy signal. I know most people don't remember what those are either. But you would get a busy signal, and you would find out if the rumor was true, had they, had they announced the spring tour dates. And then you find out when the dates are, they would say when the tickets go on sale, and you would walk, ride your bike, drive your car, take a bus down to the record store. Remember record stores, they actually existed back then. And you would come with your money and they would put a dial up phone in something called telecharge and you would get a ticket. And then that ticket would open you up to a whole different world. And that different world was actually all about an ecosystem, all about inviting a community. And if you look at the most valuable brands of the last 10 years or so, all of them, Twitter, Instagram, Apple, Facebook, they were all created and thrive with a sense of community, community, community. Every brand is built on the strength of its community. The Grateful Dead had a philosophy of, hey, you paid for the music once, it's all yours, take it, you go do whatever you want with it. So they would actually have special sections for tapers, and those tapers would be allowed to take that music, take it out of there, and start an ecosystem of trading. And people would trade tapes. And the more you traded tapes, the higher your currency was. The higher currency that you personally had, the more reverent you were for that brand. The more reverent you were for the brand, the more you talked about it. The more you gave it up to other people, the more you turned it on to others, the more that you did. And that is completely the same business premise and business model as the Apple iPhone. When they started the Apple iPhone, they said, hey, it's going to be more valuable the more people we get on it, the more things that you can do, the stickier it will be. So they went out and seeded and funded something called app developers, developers something we all hadn't heard of as well. And they went out and developed a system to get over half a million apps onto a phone system and that phone system is now infinitely more valuable, more valuable to all of us, whether you're on Android or Apple, it's more valuable to you because of the things that you can do with it. The more valuable the things are you can do with it, the stickier it is, the stickier it is, the better the economic equation, the better the economic equation, the higher the market cap. This free trade, this ecosystem, this whole system of having people engage in a community and you're at the epicenter of the community is what makes it valuable. Hippies are smart. Apple's worth $465 billion right now based on a system that's not much different than how the Grateful Dead put their business together. They put their business together in a way that almost every music act in the last 10 years has utilized to break through the clutter. Lady Gaga, 18 million followers on Facebook, 41 million followers on Instagram. They're not deadheads, they're little monsters. And they are used and invited in to be used as her currency to break through the clutter, break through the noise of a much more wired world. So as you look at these different acts and you look at what's going on, curiously enough, a big, big record, it used to be 17, 18 million, in sales, now if you get a million albums, that's a major success because people have so many different ways of buying songs, stealing songs, doing everything. It's about the live performance. It's about the community that you create. That's why the model of what was done is so interesting. So I went to my advisors here at Worcester and said, I want to do my IS on the Grateful Dead. And they said, uh-uh. We are not going to underwrite, fund, or otherwise endorse a drug-addled trip, field trip through North America for your benefit. Couldn't convince anybody to do it, couldn't convince anybody of this great idea, but I did it on the next best thing, the NFL. And I did it on how the medium of television contributed to the economic growth of the National Football League. And I owe Dr. Pollock and Dr. Sell a great deal of gratitude as well because 
One of the reasons this was an easier thing to do, although very difficult for me at the time, was to publish research on different mathematical models for the leagues and different, and different uh, um, research that was done. And what you found with the NFL was their business model was better than anybody else's. And it was better than anybody else's, the NHL, Major League Baseball, the NBA, because it was enforced socialism. And enforced socialism was the fact that every team, everybody shared everything equally. Think about that. A lot of places that's called communism. But here it was for profit, so it was all about socialism. Th the thought was, the more equal the resources that everybody had, the better the competition. The better the competition, the more the fan interest. The better the fan interest, the better the ratings. The better the ratings, the better long-term economics or the health of the league. So the thought process is that any team could beat any other team on any given weekend because theoretically, other than the human factor, the monetary factor, the access to resources is equal. That wasn't the case with the NBA, and it wasn't the case with the NHL, and it wasn't the case with baseball, where the value of the New York Yankees because of that media market was always going to be better than the Kansas City Royals or the Cincinnati Reds or whomever. There was great inequality. The better you can make competition in sports, particularly professional sports, the better that the model is going to become for the long term. Valuations don't lie. The NFL consistently over the past... 12 years or so, um, 15 years, has consistently been higher than all of the other leagues, almost all the other leagues combined. So if you look at business models, and what I get to do for a living now is I get to extend, create, and build business models for companies. And I have been so fortunate to be able to work with great independent thinkers. And I'm going to get to wh what I hope is my legacy as the best business model I ever was a team member of or helped create. And, but I want to underline the importance of business models. This is one of my favorite quotes by Warren Buffett. Is, as you're investing and putting something together, you want to make sure that the model of what's going on, what's happening, and as, as was stated here earlier, the model of Worcester, the model of liberal arts education is such that it's a great investment in your time, it's a great investment in your children's time, it's a great investment, period. But you want to make sure that model works. And what I learned how to do here was look at a model, examine a model, and then hopefully be in a position one day to help create a model. And in 2003, a couple friends of mine came to me and said, look, we've been, we've been trying to figure out how to get more attention to the AIDS crisis in Africa. And one guy was Bono, and the other guy was Bobby Shriver, people that I've known for a long time and have become some of my closest friends on earth. And you look at what they were doing, they had a group called DATA, which was date, uh, Debt, AIDS, and Trade Relief for Africa. And they were trying to get the, the millennial debt canceled. And that debt was all about um, African nations that were saddled with so much debt they were never, ever going to get out. It needed to be canceled. And they accomplished that. Two or three guys, independent thinkers, had a different way of doing things. And they literally helped change millions and millions of lives. The next challenge was AIDS, weren't getting anywhere. And I remember, like yesterday, they sat and told me, here's an amazing statistic. 7,000 people a day are dying of a largely preventable and treatable disease. 7,000 a day. It's equivalent of 25 747s crashing and burning every single day. We've got to figure out how to solve that problem. We've got to figure out how to get attention to it. So we went out for the next two years and created a business model. And the business model was very simple. If we create desire and virtue amongst the consumer, the consumer will pay attention. If the consumer pays attention, companies will pay attention. If companies and consumers pay attention, politicians will pay attention. That led to a whole notion of creating products that people could desire and at the same time do something virtuous. And that virtuousness was using a red credit card, shopping with the Gap for their red products, buying a red Motorola phone, putting your mutual fund with somebody red, allowed you to interact with an issue that was about number 350 on the issue list of worries for Americans and brought it right up to the top. 
And what we were able to do is then get the politicians involved and get something called the Global Fund together. And the Global Fund um, has several billion dollars in it. We at RED raised over $250 million and are still going, which means that over 40 million people in Africa have a different way of life and over 10 million more on, our, on antiretroviral drugs. And that's what I learned to do at Worcester. This woman, his name is Concilia Noir, and she is from Zambia. This is with her before she got access to antiretroviral drugs. This is her now. For $140 a year, what some of you might spend on a family dinner, you can keep one person alive who, because of the grace of God, didn't have access to anything else. This is what I learned how to do at Worcester. This is the power of independent thought, and I thank you very much.